Well, it's a, a privilege to be here. Thank you for inviting us, Paul. And uh, I think this is the biggest building I've preached in so far. So it's huge. It's, it's really impressive. I, I really pray the Lord fill, fill this place with, with true believers and that this be a place of refuge where people will hear about this church and flock because the times are coming when there won't be anywhere to go but oasis is like this this is a refuge so I really enjoyed the worship I thank the Lord that he spoke to us through that and um, I pray that he'll speak now through me I'm just a vessel so let's just come to the Lord Father God we we love you we adore you we thank you for your grace and your mercy your faithfulness to us we thank you that you don't abandon us but you keep chasing after us even when we go astray that you are that great shepherd of the sheep and that you look for that one that's lost Lord we have all been lost in the past and perhaps even now we've stepped off the path Lord bring us back Bring us back to that place of knowing you, not in the mind, but in the heart, in the soul. Lord, I, uh, we all have a story to tell, Lord. We all have a, a testimony. I pray now that this testimony that you've given me, this, this is my story, this is our story as a family, and I pray that your spirit will bring uh, to the surface that which this congregation needs to hear, maybe an individual in this congregation that you would have your way through me lord that i would just be that vessel i'm nothing i need your spirit now lord to work through me bless us all together as one body in jesus name amen okay um i don't know if paul or anyone said anything about um, our background but um we were once Jehovah's Witnesses. So I've entitled this, Finding the Real Jesus. Finding the Real Jesus. Just before we start, I know you've been stood a while, but could you all stand back up, please, if you can? Okay. Now, could you sit down if you have once, in the past, being baptized as a Jehovah's Witness. Okay. Could you sit down if perhaps you became what was known as an unbaptized Jehovah's Witness? No. Could you sit down if you maybe have studied with Jehovah's Witnesses? Okay. Could you sit down if you've spoken to a Jehovah's Witness? Ah, there we go. Everyone's sat. That just really emphasizes how active this group is. You know, there are now 8 million um, Jehovah's Witnesses. There's far more, actually, but 8 million are recorded. It's only those that actually go door knocking that are recorded as witnesses. So. There's probably double that amount, and maybe, maybe four or five times that amount who have, have gone away but retained their doctrine. Now, I've brought with me, I don't, I had, we don't have witnesses call anymore because we're apostates, so they don't come to our door, but I've noticed that they use, um, that they're getting a bit technological and they use a, a pad now. But when we were witnesses, they would come to your door with a, something like that, yeah? Would you like to know what's in that? The secrets of a Jehovah's Witness bag. Let me just show you a few bits that we used to carry, and I think they probably still do. They will have their New World translation of the Bible, their own translation that they produced in the 50s. They've got a new one now. They've slightly changed um, text that, you know, suit their doctrine. Um, it's now silver, not, not red. Yeah. 
If they're coming to your door, they may come with a, a book that they want to show you and invite you to have a Bible study. They used to carry this, which is known as the reasoning, reasoning from the scriptures. It's topical, so you can look at the front of different topics like the soul or hell, and then you have a quick reference and you can, you know, proof text the, the, the um, householder. And it's, an, it's what they use to try and not only engage, but destroy a person's particular belief. If it's a Thursday meeting, they'll have this, which is known as a kingdom ministry, and they uh, go through it, parrot fashion, answering all the questions, and um, you're welcome to have a look at that. In fact, in this one, from 2007, talking about house-to-house -house witnessing, house-to-house -house witnessing has a scriptural basis. Jesus instructed 70 disciples to go into house-to-house. No, he didn't. Yeah, but um, obviously that's their, that's their doctrine, which really forces them out door to door. Now, if any of you have studied, I'm sure you all have studied, but if you've picked up commentaries on uh, a particular Bible book, a good one you'll know is probably about that fat. Yeah? This book, All Scripture is Inspired of God, that is their book for, for the whole Bible, a commentary on the whole Bible. That's it. Pretty pathetic, really. And it's all directed at really worshipping the organisation. On a, on a Thursday night, they'll have this. Benefit from the Theocratic Ministry School. And this is, Thursday night is an education night where you train to actually go door knocking, how to engage people. And there's all sorts of um, methods in here of how to actually accurately do that they have a song book I wouldn't advise singing any of it but it's very stoic and yeah. and there's a few other bits but the main the main one I want to show you is uh, are these these two which you will what they offer you the awaken the Watchtower magazine. Um, I've got one here from 2007, which was when we came out, properly came out. Um, and that's 35 pages long. They've now reduced it down to about 15 pages, and everything is going really away from printing and into the technological um, online. They, they direct you to their Watchtower organization, jw.org if you've ever spoken to them. But um, the same themes that they run over and over, one way to happiness, what does the future hold, same, same old stuff, inviting you to Bible studies. But you can't deny their achievements. You all sat down, which means you've all spoken to them, you all, all had some contact. The Watchtower here, uh, this is... this. I think last month's issue, 70 million copies printed each month in 334 languages. You know, that their proselytizing is, is incredible. And that's the Watchtower, and the Wake's not far, far behind. Um, 65 million copies in 182 languages. So these are an active group. Now, how did they begin? I just want to give you a very potted, very brief, because I, I, I see that on uh, your church website, Paul's done an excellent summary of Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, more than that, it's an in-depth study. So I'd encourage you to go there to know more about them. But very quickly, a potted history. It was founded by a guy called Charles Taze Russell. Um, he was actually brought up a Presbyterian. His parents were of Irish descent. He was born in 1852. And his mother died at the age of nine. Now, any of us who have experienced death, and especially if you've experienced it as a child, it, it creates great trauma. 
Now, he was in a Presbyterian church, a very Calvinist church, and um, he couldn't get his head around hell. He couldn't get his head around um, that his mother might not be in heaven. And he really struggled with that. And that pushed him away from Presbyterianism. He moved then into a congregational church, but he continued to struggle really with hell in particular. And in the end, he just gave up on Christianity. He just walked away. And he began to study Eastern religions and, and looked at different um, other possible avenues. And then he, when he was 17, he happened upon a meeting. So he was just walking down the street one evening and there was a meeting on in this particular hall. And the guy um, leading it was called Jonas Wendell. Now Jonas Wendell was what's known as an age to come Adventist. If you know anything about Adventism, seven day Adventists, there were lots of little branches that broke off after the, their failure, and they, they predicted that Jesus would return in 1844, um, the Millerites they were called back then, and because that failed, you had all these branches that came off. Wendell was part of one of those branches, and he was teaching that Jesus would return in 1874. So they'd moved on a bit. Obviously, he didn't come back, and so they decided that he did actually come back, but invisibly. And so 1874 was this date. It was actually taught by a guy called Nelson Barber. And Russell went into that meeting and he bought into that, what he was taught. This was before 1874. So he really threw himself into it. And one of the things that I think appealed to him is they were teaching annihilationism, which is that there is no hell, that, that there's no soul, that there's um, extinction when you die. And really the focus of this age to come group was... Um, a paradise earth. And, and that, in a sense, really appeals to the flesh. You know? This, this, it really does appeal to the flesh, this idea that you can inherit everything and have everything that you want. It's, 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 a, strange, um, it's a strange thing. We used to talk about it. We used to, when we were JW, we used to think, oh, when Armageddon comes, I can, I can pillage the streets and break into the shops and take whatever I want. And, and that's the mentality, a very carnal mentality. But anyway, Russell was um, introduced to that. He wrote a book um, with Nelson Barber, and then finally they split after 1874 because Jesus didn't come back. But as I said, they dealt with that by saying he came back invisibly. And so when, Bar sorry, when uh, Russell left, he then founded his own magazine. By the way, he was quite wealthy. His father had a, 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 a large haberdashery store in Pennsylvania, and he used money from that to, to begin this new magazine. Um, and really, the 1800s was a time of magazines. There was loads of different groups printing magazines, um, and he launched what was called Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence. Now it's just called the Watchtower, you see. But then it was called Zion's Watchtower because they had a real understanding that, of Israel. They believed that Israel would be restored. Um, and the date for Jesus' actual, or rather the date for Armageddon, they, they worked out at 1914. So for those 40 years, Russell and his companions preached on the return of Christ in 1914. Now again, he didn't come back, did he? And Russell died in 1916, which really left the movement in disarray. It was taken um, on board by a guy called Rutherford, and he really reformed the whole movement and brought in new doctrines. But really there, throughout, it's been um, um, one of um, disappointment, you know, saying this date, Jesus is coming. That day, 1925, and the biggest one in recent times, or fairly recent times, was 1975. So what are the distinctives of this group? Well, by distinctives, I mean how do they differ from biblical Christianity? Very, very briefly, these are just some of the things, and there's many more. Um, Let's start with some of the more incidental ones. They, they don't believe Jesus was crucified on a cross. 
They believe it was an upright stake and that Jesus was like that. So you'll see in all their books, Jesus like this. Um, I've mentioned they deny hell. They don't believe that we have a soul. We, they believe that when you die, you cease to exist until the resurrection. And then at the bodily resurrection, really, you're recreated. I mean, it, that's a good question to ask them. If, if you cease to exist, where are you? If, you? if you're gone, I mean, fully gone, there's no soul, there's no consciousness, then um, they don't really think it right through. But that's one of their beliefs. You will have heard that they don't believe in blood transfusions. That came in in the 1930s. Um, they don't salute flags. They don't sing national anthems. They're a very separatist group. Um, don't have Christmas, don't have birthdays, don't have Easter. Now, I know some of those things are connected with paganism, but, but really Rutherford, in that second president, wanted to just strip the whole movement of any vestige of Christendom and he, he reformed it. They believe that there are only 144,000 that will go to heaven, and they believe that these are specially anointed men and women that have been chosen from the time of Jesus um, up to, well, they'd said nine, the 19, 1936, I think it was, but and this group, they say, will rule with Jesus over the earth, and that on the earth, which they believe will last for eternity, will be um, human beings, uh, like, like me and you, just human beings. They have no understanding of salvation in the Christian sense. They have no understanding that we are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And that's an important point to note. They are a works-orientated orientated religion. They earn their salvation. doesn't matter what they tell you, they earn it. They have to door knock. Their meetings are um, Tuesday night, Thursday night, and Sunday morning. Two meetings on the Thursday. But remember, they have to prepare for these meetings. You have to have all your books prepared, everything underlined. You're asked questions. So Monday night, you're preparing for Tuesday. Wednesday night, you're preparing for Thursday. Friday night, you're preparing for door-to-door -door knocking, you know, practicing how you'll engage people. Saturday morning, and sometimes the whole day, you're door knocking. Sunday's the meeting. Saturday night, you've got to prepare for Sunday. So it's a very, very busy schedule for a Jehovah's Witness if they're dedicated. And if you're dedicated, then you move up the ladder. You know, if you're a yes man, you move up the ladder. What else? Probably the most, um, the, the greatest distinctive that really separates them from true Christianity is their denial of Jesus' deity. They do not believe Jesus is God in the flesh. They do not believe that God incarnated in the flesh, the second person of the Trinity. So they're anti-Trinitarian. They're actually Arians, or a, a, um, a, um, uh, a mutation of Arianism. They do focus very much on the millennial kingdom, although really that's, that kingdom is something that goes on forever. They believe that everyone who's ever lived will get a second chance. They won't tell you that on the doors, but that's what they believe. They believe that Jesus died not as um, the atonement in the, the way we understand it, but they believe he died in the sense of buying back the right to life or the right to a second chance. So they believe that everybody who's ever died, apart from that small 144,000, unless they're really wicked, then they might not be resurrected. And that there'll be this great judgment where everyone has to receive this knowledge that they teach, and if they respond, they will be allowed to live forever on the earth in paradise. And their job for the first thousand years will be to put everything right, you know, to, to fix things. And that's really what they're looking forward to. They're, they're desperate for Armageddon because Armageddon is their salvation. They believe the Holy Spirit is a force. They don't believe the Holy Spirit is deity. They believe it's some sort of force that you plug into. 
Um, they believe that Satan rules the world. Now, I know we have the scripture that mentions Satan in that capacity, but they, they take it to a whole new level. It's as if God is really just out of the way and, and in no, no control of anything, and that Satan really has the world in his hands, which is not true. Satan does affect this system. You know, he does, does, he's on a leash, that's the point. They really pit Satan and Jehovah against one another. So anyway, that's it in a, in a nutshell. All of these points that I've mentioned, especially the, the, the anti-Trinitarianism and their denial of faith alone for salvation, it makes, makes them, in our eyes as Christians, heret heretics and a cult. And you'll see as we go through my, our testimony just, just really why... I can say that with confidence. Okay, my, my story, um, I'm going to share a bit about our journey in and out of the, the watchtower and I'll invite Jen, if that's all right, to share a, a little bit as well um, from her perspective. Now my background is that I grew up in, in Lincolnshire. It's a farming area, so my father was a land worker. We were, that sort of work, dad was in and out of work, so it was difficult financially. Um, he had links with Pentecostal churches and was very much into revivalist type um, meetings back in the 60s, um, and there were a lot of faith healers that would go around and he really latched into that, mainly because his mother was always very poorly. My mother was raised an Anglican, so as children we went to the Anglican church on and off. Um, shall I tell you when I was born? You'll know my age then, though, won't you? Um, 1971 I came along, and my mother and father really didn't bother with church or anything after that. Um, it was all really about how to survive. Now, I mentioned earlier, 1975 was a date that the Jehovah's Witnesses said would be the end of the world. And um, my uncle, who had been a Catholic, had them come and, and he was just ripe to receive their message. And so he became a Jehovah's Witness in 1974, mainly because he was worried about Armageddon, I think. Um, uh, unfortunately, he couldn't get his wife, or fortunately rather, he couldn't get his wife to accept that religion. And so after 75, he fell away. But the point I'm trying, I'm getting to is that he retained his beliefs as a Jehovah's Witness. And as a child, 12, 13, or even younger, I was always fascinated by the supernatural. I was always fascinated by what's a ghost and... If you remember in the, I think it was in the late 70s, early 80s, there was a, a program on, I think it was BBC, called Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World. And that had all sorts of fascinating, weird stuff on crystal skulls and Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, and all these things I was really interested in. This, and my uncle saw this. And so he began to teach me from the Bible what he thought were the explanations and he began to really indoctrinate me. Now, back then, the witnesses had a, a blue book that they called The Truth That Leads to Eternal Life. That was their book for doing Bible studies, um, which are not Bible studies, by the way. They're just, it's just a form of indoctrination. You read the, pa the paragraph, you answer the question from the paragraph, and slowly you become indoctrinated. Um, I read that book and I was convinced, probably by the age of 15, that that was the only or the nearest to Christianity that you could get. And I had no information otherwise. You know, although I went to church, it was the Anglican church, it was just liturgy. I had no understanding of, of anything and I had nowhere to go. Our uh, Methodist chapels had been closed down. Um, there was just nowhere. So, in God's providence, he allowed me to be drawn into that. Now, around the same age, 
uh, 15. Now, I'm not promoting that you young ones get involved in relationships at age 15, but we weren't Christians, and my, myself and Jen began courting around about that age, and I, I really wanted her to, to get it, um, but she was having none of it. She, she'll explain that she didn't come from a, any religious background, or she'll, ex, she'll explain as well some of the other things that went on around that time. Let me just jump ahead now. We, we got married when we were 19, and um, I just got involved in all sorts of nonsense because, in my mind, Armageddon was coming, yeah? And Armageddon meant for me extinction. It meant that I was going to be destroyed by this Jehovah. He was going to blast me with fire and sulfur, and that would be me gone forever. So I thought, well, if Jen won't become a witness, if I can't join this religion and actually save myself and my family, because that's the only way you can be saved, is by doing all that they ask you to do. Then I thought, well, I may as well do what I want. And that caused a lot of grief to the point where we nearly separated. Um, and Jen will explain that we actually, we got to the point where we, we, we would have been separated, but they, they came a-knocking again. Yeah, they came a-knocking, and, and Jen responded, thinking that she knew that I was interested, really interested, and she knew that from her point of view, the only way to save the marriage would be to go down this path of the Jehovah's Witnesses. So she started a Bible study, I packed in all the nonsense, and I started studying, and so together we, we, we got indoctrinated. And um, really the internet wasn't there to be able to really check out any alternative views. Or if it was, it was very it was in its infancy. And so we I got baptized when I was twenty-four as a Jehovah's Witness. Incidentally, I wrote a letter to the Anglican priest to say I was leaving, and he sent a letter back saying, I wish you all the best. He didn't explain nothing. He didn't say you're going into a cult, he didn't he didn't explain anything. Um, and later he joined the Catholic Church. So anyway. What next? Well, I threw myself into the religion. Um, I tried very hard to get my uncle to come back, but sadly he died of, of cancer. In fact, he died guilt-ridden that he hadn't gone back. You know, absolutely just, it was awful to see. Guilt is something they use to motivate. The Lord Jesus does not motivate by guilt. If you feel guilty and, and, you know, oh, I feel guilty, I must go to church, I must do that. That's not how Jesus, well, it's not how the Holy Spirit motivates. He draws through love. He draws through what he's done. You respond to his love. They motivate by guilt. If you don't go door knocking, you're made to feel guilty. If you miss door knocking for any length of time, you become marginalized within that group. And so this is how we live. But I threw myself into it. Because I was convinced Armageddon was coming. In fact, they told us that our children would not leave primary school, was it? You know, that Armageddon would be here within five years, and that was in, I think, 94. Well, obviously, it never happened again. But I, as I say, I threw myself into it. I became what was known in their religion a ministerial servant, which is equivalent to a deacon. And I began to do um, public talks and... I uh, help with Kingdom Hall builds. You know, when they need a new Kingdom Hall, they all help each other build it. They have it, it's all paid for by the society. Um, that's the Watchtower Society. And then loans are repaid. And incredible how they actually work. But the whole thing for me became overbearing. Our children, now we, we, we appreciate that. Discipline is necessary. The Bible speaks about discipline, but their discipline was like on a whole new level. I mean, making children sit. Um, now, I'm not saying children can't sit, but it was the way they did it. it would take them out, smack them, take them back. And, and it was, I mean, we saw awful things when it came to children. And I just, I just accepted that was the right thing. That was Jehovah's way. And I regret that. I regret the fact that we allowed others to administer discipline to our children. So this whole thing began to get on top of me. 
Um, I have, there's, there's a Jehovah's Witness um, public talk outline. That was one that I did. And it, it, you're given these, and they're just um, parrot fashion. You have to, you can, you can adapt it slightly, but you have to really read what they tell you. And that comes straight from New York. And all the congregations receive, um, well, not, they get the same public talks, but the point what I'm trying to get at is it, it, you're controlled, yeah? Every aspect of your life is controlled. If you young ones or any of you think that you're controlled in a church environment, you haven't got a clue. Join a cult. No, don't join a cult, but a cult controls, and, and we've been through it. We know what it's like. In the end, I experienced some sort of breakdown or burnout. You have to remember, I was doing it all on my own strength, because you don't worship the true God. You worship the God of the watchtower. Some of us can do it, you know, all their lives, somehow like robots. But for me, I, I burnt out, and I couldn't take it anymore. Um, I didn't know what was happening to me. I began to see the whole setup differently. I began to see this really heavy hierarchical system where I had no voice. Now, I don't know how your church governance or church uh, polity works here, but you know, we do have a voice, but not in the Jehovah's Witnesses. You do as you're told from the front, and the elders do as they're told from what's called the circuit overseer, and he does what he's told from the zone overseer, and they do what they're told straight from Brooklyn, New York. Very heavy-handed, top-down hierarchy. And so I, as I say, began to have what I would term disquieting thoughts, really just very uneasy, and seeing people marginalised, people who were struggling, you know, there was one guy struggling with alcohol, and um, instead of helping him, they just disfellowship. Now, if you're disfellowshipped, they stop talking to you. And I mean, they shun you. Now, they'll say it's with a view to restoration, but it's evil. Their method of shunning is, is, is just pure evil. They want, basically, they want you out so that you have no influence. And that would include not just moral things but you'll see as in our case questioning their beliefs i tried to escape the sunday meetings <laughs> by um, starting a new business that involved having to travel around on the weekends and i was really just trying to escape the whole thing but I'd, I'd, at the same time, I felt this guilt, this completely guilt-ridden that I might be hurting Jehovah. Um, but anyway, it just all built up. And I remember what Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. He said, Come to me, you who are toiling and loaded down, and I will refresh you. And, you know, they used to use that verse a lot, but I never, ever felt refreshed. How could you? I didn't even know Jesus. All I knew was this Jehovah God who was some overbearing, wrathful God ready to bash me at any moment because I wasn't doing what they were telling me to do. Very cold, very hard. This is about loyalty to an organization. Loyalty to a group. There's no real love in that movement. They'll come to your door all smiles and all happy, but it's false. If you go to their kingdom hall, they'll love bomb you and they'll, because they want you to become one of them. But it's all false. There's no true love. Now, don't get me wrong, they'll help one another. You know, they, they do do that. Um, but that love that I know now through Christ, they don't have it. They can't have it. By the way, just looking at the wine down there, when they have their, um, once a year they, they have the emblems on Passover. They're obsessed with it being on Nisan 14. And the congregation gather, much as you have gathered, and the wine is in a, a chalice, in a, in a glass, and it's passed 
and nobody drinks it. They all pass it by. They pass by the way to life. They pass by Christ. Can you believe that? I used to do that. The first time I could do, take the emblems was just incredible. To think that I was in that new covenant. They're not in it. Only the 144,000 can partake. Anyway, it progressed to the point where I wanted to um, speak to or get help from them. I arranged for, um, to meet the circuit overseer. A circuit overseer is in charge of a region. You must understand that the Jehovah's Witnesses split Great Britain up into regions and those regions are split up into territories and congregation members are given territory maps. Wolverhampton it will be split up and each congregation will have a map of a certain territory and they'll work that over and over and over trying to get people to uh, join them. Anyway, I met with this circuit overseer and my question to him was, do you believe that Armageddon is imminent? Because they've preached that, haven't they, in all their watchtowers since it began. Armageddon's tomorrow. And I asked him, do you really believe it's imminent? And he said, well, yes, of course I do. And I said, then why are we spending thousands and thousands of hours, why am I burning myself out knocking on doors when we could tell people that Armageddon's imminent? And he said, how? I said, television. We, the, the Watchtowers, you know, the society's got billions of pounds. Why not have TV adverts? Why not, in our congregation, I think we had about £10,000 saved. I said, why don't we use that as a double-page spread in the newspaper, local paper, saying Armageddon's imminent. See, when you push them on it, they don't want to go there. Because although it's imminent, we can use that imminency to drive the congregation. You must go out this Saturday or you might be killed on Sunday. Do you know? It's this guilt thing. But when he was pushed, he said, oh, well, we don't do it that way. That's not how we do it. We follow the way of um, the apostles door to door. I was expecting some sort of biblical explanation. No Bible came out, just completely empty. What he really was telling me to do was knuckle down and follow, and I don't know if you've heard this phrase, the faithful slave. They call the men at the top the faithful slave. They take it from Matthew 24, where Jesus, in their, in their version, says, who is the faithful a discreet slave. And they believe that they, these 144,000, are the faithful and discreet slaves. So they, they really told me, look, just knuckle down, wait on Jehovah, do what he's telling you to do, and, and, and get on with it. And uh, I couldn't. I, I just couldn't do it anymore. Um, I didn't know what to tell Jen. I didn't know what to tell my mum and dad because I'd got them involved. They'd become Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, I just didn't know what to do. I, I would drive to the woods and I would walk through the woods and look at the trees and think, I really ought to bring a rope and just get this over and done with. Because I thought that death was the end. So I thought, I, I've got to get out of this. I've got to escape this. Unbeknown to me, and Jen will share this, she was feeling the same way. But neither of us expressed it Finally, I did. I said to Jen that I, I can't do it anymore. Thankfully, she said, no, let's take some time out. Jacob was 15 at the time. That's my oldest son. He really struggled. He'd been brought up in it. His friends were all there. So my mum and dad kept going and Jacob would go. Um, the youngest ones um, stopped going. So there's friction within the family. By the way, they break up families. They break up families. If you become a Jehovah's Witness, and your husband isn't, they'll tell you to leave him. Yeah? They told my uncle to leave his wife because she kept doing Christmas. And, um, you know, they're not allowed to do Christmas. So, this is the sort of thing that you uh, have to deal with. And so, depression for me really set in. And I became very angry and bitter towards Jehovah. I remember I would go out and say, just, just kill me now. Just, just get it over with. I, I don't, 
I suppose I was a coward and wouldn't get the rope, but you know, I would sometimes just say, kill me, I've had enough. I would, I remember watching Titanic and um, seeing the film and see the boat go down and think, oh Jehovah, you're evil. Why didn't you save those people? Why didn't you lift the boat out of the ocean? Why didn't you just end this? Why did you even start it? That was how I felt because I had no understanding whatsoever of God. The elders told me that they would help me readjust my thinking. You know, a bit like the PC world we have now. You know, well, readjust your thinking. That's the sign of a cult. And so we drifted away and we stopped going. When you do that, you become marked. And they stop talking to you. If you're not going... They, they stop talking to you. If you're not knocking on doors, how can you be a Jehovah's Witness? You have to be knocking on doors. You have to be doing everything. So I submerged myself to escape in, in work, really. Um, very depressed. Didn't know what to do, where to go. And really, we began to find some solace within the family as we left or, or drifted away. And you know, they never, well, I think one came to see us in six years. One, one elder came to see us in six years. People who we had gone on holiday with and, and were very close to, never just because we said we need to take time out. In 2002, um, I hope I got this right, Jasmine was born, yes. And we had a beautiful baby girl, and I was dreading a fourth child. We had three boys. Life was difficult enough, and to think we would have another was just, you know, I wasn't in the right place to deal with it. But she came along, and you know, to have a baby girl, to pick that baby up, and she, she, she through Jasmine, the Lord began to speak life into me. This beautiful daughter. I love the boys, don't worry, Joel. I love you as well. But there was something that God began to do there. And I can't pinpoint exactly when, but probably about five or six years after we had drifted, I began to, felt drawn to start looking again. Not looking at their material, but looking at the Bible again. And so I got myself, I had their, they have what's called an interlinear Bible, which is um, Greek and, and English. So I used that because I was very cerebral in my thinking, very doctrinally minded. I wanted to try and work out what was what. And one of the things that motivated me to do that, it was obviously the Holy Spirit drawing me, but in addition, there was a couple of Christians that I'd actually spoken to during my time of ministry, which was around about 10 years of door knocking. Um, by the way, only two challenged me in 10 years. Only two Christians. The rest would say, I'm a Christian. Bush. And I'd go, see, they're not Christians. Never close the door on them. Always speak to them. And I'll come to that a bit later. But anyway, um, I began to search. I, I'd heard this one Christian say to me, I went to a kingdom hall once and I said, oh, right, great. Where did you go? And she told me. And she said, but they don't have the Holy Spirit. And I thought, what's she on about? Holy Spirit's a force. Who's this Holy Spirit thing? But that rattled around in my head. See, when you sow a seed, often that rattles around. Won't leave them alone. And another seed was sown by a, um, a street preacher in Boston. And I got into an argument with him about the Trinity because I... That was my pet thing, you know, to destroy that silly Trinity doctrine. And um, he didn't do any good, but his parting shot was, I pray you find the real Jesus. And you know, that struck me. That really just struck me straight through. I thought, what are you talking about? I know Jesus. He's that, he's that archangel, Michael, who, um, that, I didn't mention that earlier, but they believe he's an archangel, Michael, a, a created being. But that 
those two things rattled around. Oh, and one more thing, a, a retired minister. <laughs> You'll like this. One, one John, um, sorry, first, first chapter of John, first verse, um, where it says that Jesus was God. In the Jehovah's Witness Bible, they put an A in. Jesus was a God, and then put a small G to make him lesser than Almighty God. Anyway, I, I, I knew a, a vicar lived at this address, and I challenged him on it. In fact, I took him a brochure on the Trinity, and he said, hang on a minute, and he went away. And he came back with a, a, Greek, sept, a Greek Bible, that's right, and a Latin Vulgate Bible, spoke to me in Latin and Greek, told me about all the prepositions and the and how it all worked, and I just stood there, and I, I realized then I knew nothing. I, I knew nothing. And, and so those three things really helped me, I believe, along with the Holy Spirit, to begin to get back to who was the real Jesus. So I sat down at my kitchen table, and I prayed, Jehovah, show me who Jesus is. I didn't go to any church. I didn't go anywhere else. I just said, show me who the real Jesus is. Who is he? And I began to read from, from Matthew onwards. And what did I begin to see? I began to see Jesus, the real Jesus. I began to see that this Jesus could hush the storm. Hush. I saw him say, your sins are forgiven. I saw the Jews trying to stone him for saying, I am. I began to see that this Jesus was no angel. He was God incarnate. When you get to the end of the Gospel of John, what does Thomas say? My Lord and my God. Thank God for God's grace. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't leave us to rot in that place. Sorry. So I began to really do some proper Bible study. I started to underline verses where it said that Jesus would appear, that he was coming. They don't believe Jesus is coming back. They don't, they don't believe he's coming back in the sense of appearing. He's just going to stay in heaven and then bash everybody. But I began to see, and I began to see that quotes in the Old Testament that applied to Yahweh were applied to Jesus Christ. In fact, let's look at one. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Verse 4, I'm reading from a Jewish, the Jewish Bible. Um, I brought it up because that was one of the Bibles that helped me when I was coming come to faith. I don't use it anymore, but I'll read it. Grace and shalom to you, sorry, grace and shalom to you uh, from the one who is, the one who is coming, 
from the sevenfold spirit before his throne, from Yeshua the Messiah, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him, the one who loves us, who has freed us from our sins at the cost of his blood, who has caused us to be a kingdom of priests for to God his Father, to him be glory and rulership forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him, including those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the land will mourn him, referring to Jesus. Amen, amen. I am the A and the Z. I am the Alpha and Omega, says Adonai. The God of heaven's arm is the one who is, the one who was, and the one who's coming. We begin to see that quotes are being made of Almighty God and applied to Jesus. We go on to verse 17. Um, I saw him and I fell down at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me and he said, Don't be afraid, I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever. They're speaking about Jesus, but he's quoting from Isaiah 41, which refers to Yahweh. And so the Lord began to take, the scowls just began to fall. And I began to see this glorious Jesus in all his glory and who he truly was. What do you do with that? What do you do with that when you're a Jehovah's Witness? You're going to lose everything. You're going to lose absolutely everything. If you tell anybody, if you even whisper that, you're out. But you know when the Lord gets a hold of you, and when he starts to work on your heart, and the Holy Spirit begins to draw you, and that hardness begins to just go, and you begin to feel loved by God, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When I began to feel the love of God that I'd never felt, you can't shut up. And I dared to go on the internet. That was one of the things they always said, don't do that. Don't never go on the internet. I went on the internet. I began to look at other views of Jehovah's Witnesses. And I bought some books. I bought a book by a guy called Ray Franz. And believe it or not, Ray France had been on the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses right at the very pinnacle of that organization. His uncle had been the president. And he left in 19, I think it was 79, after the debacle of 75, and he found Jesus. Right at the very top. And so he wrote this book, two books actually. One was called Crisis of Conscience, the other In Search of Christian Freedom. And I just sucked that up. I just read through and he exposed the whole thing. All the evil that they do behind closed doors. All the double-mindedness, the hypocrisy. He just threw it all out there. And it was, well, the scales had at last fallen from my eyes, the watchtower spell was broken. And so I began to share uh, some with Jen. Jen was really not interested. She just wanted to just carry on. Things were okay. But there was a guy in the congregation who began to take around the the, the kingdom hall some books, very early um, volumes of they're called Studies in the Scriptures, written by Charles Tage Russell. And I was trying to find an ally, that's it. I was trying to find an ally within, within the Kingdom Hall, someone I could speak to, because uh, where do you go? I, I had no one to go to. So this guy came round and he was talking about these, and to cut a long story short, I said something that just really got under his skin, and, and we had an argument, and I had to ask him to leave. And I knew that was it, the writing was on the wall. <laughs> you know, I knew that, man, this was, it was all over. And the next day, two elders. One elder who had been my mentor. The man who, even to this day, I still love. My mentor. And another elder. And what was their question? Oh, Jason, do you know what? We've missed you so much. You know, we haven't seen you for so many years. You know, it'd be great if we could see you, maybe have a coffee together? No. After six years, he just said, I want to know what you said to that man in your house. You tell us what you said to him. 
on my doorstep. I could have laid them, do you know what I mean? I could have just, I was so angry. I was fuming that they had the audacity to come after all that time. And that's the control they have over members. Absolute, abject control. It was truly hurtful to have that happen. And so I knew that what was coming next. What they do with a troublemaker <laughs> is they have what they call a judicial committee. You are hauled before probably three or four elders. Some of them they might bring from other congregations. And they basically grill you. And if you don't tell them what they want to hear, they'll disfellowship you. Which means you're out and you've lost everything. That means even your own mother and father and brother and sister will not speak to you. Everything, gone. So I knew they were coming. I knew they would be planning. So I thought, I'm going to get in here. By this time, I might add, I believe I'd come to faith. You know, I asked the Lord into my life. I, I remember it distinctly. I'm going to do it. I'm going to pray to Jesus. I'm going to pray. I, I'm going to pray. I can pray. He's God. I can pray to him. And I pray to Jesus. Now, I know that you might say, oh, no, you pray to the Father, through the Spirit, to Jesus, you know, all this. But the mechanics of it, I believe, we have one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And in certain circumstances, we can call upon them. And so I spoke to Jesus, and I gave my life to him. And I didn't really know how you do that. You know, you have you know, altar calls, and you have, read this sentence. I didn't know how that, but I knew that something had happened, something had changed. And so I was ready to take this step of getting out of this group. By this time, I'd spoken a lot to Jen, told her, or I think I told her most of it. And so I prepared a 28-page treaty, <laughs> and I just went through all their doctrines, and I quoted what they'd said, and, and I just um, presented that to the congregation. The congregation never read it. It was taken by the elders. They read it. Um, my accountant was a Jehovah's Witness. I mailed a copy to him. We spoke to our friends, and Jen will tell you more about that. We told them that what we were going to do, which was to disassociate. Maybe it's the coward's way out, but I just couldn't face that judicial committee. And so I, we disassociated, sent the letter. And at the end of the letter, I put this. I put, if you really have the truth, by the way, they call their organization the truth. You know, we say, when we meet, we say... Um, you know, what's your testimony? When were you saved? How did you get saved? They'll say, when did you learn the truth? When did you come into the truth? So they call it the truth. By the way, Jesus is the truth. Amen? Not any organization. So anyway, I um, sent this letter off and expected a, a response, which we got eventually. They had to wait for the circuit overseer to come because he really is above them and they had to pass it through him and finally they got round to it and we were officially announced as disassociated. That means you're dead. You're, no, you're nothing, you're scum, you're gone. And Jen will explain what happened after that. But I'll just tell you my accountant. My accountant said, because they announced this from the platform on, on a Thursday night that we had disassociated, my accountant said to me, don't worry, I'll keep um, doing your book work, nothing will change. That very night, late on, maybe 10, 11 o'clock, he popped through my door a, a vitriolic five-page letter saying, I don't want to know you anymore. He'd done my accounts for maybe, I don't know, 10 years maybe. That was just one example of the way that we were treated and, and shunned. Um, yeah, close friends, and let, let me just um, invite Jen to just share a little bit. Right, um, yeah, it was quite uh, distressing and um, 
traumatic time. I'm not going to really share anything about my testimony other than um, just the, the hurt and the pain that we actually experienced. And um, it's amazing how you kind of go through these things in life. And Jason was talking about how people kind of treated us. And um, one of my very closest friends, um, Ali Walker, she was married, she had five children, and her husband left her because she had got health issues. And the Jehovah's Witnesses that were supposedly her brothers and sisters, they didn't really rally around her at all. They didn't do anything to help her. Um, and she was quite, she was disillusioned with everything. So I, there was me and one other sister that really kept in contact with her. And um, we saw, I think women are affected much, very differently to men. We're very emotional and um, my experience is that we saw a lot of people that were very um, cast to one side. Jason's already mentioned the brother that was um, disfellowshipped. But there were others that were treated very badly and it was a, a conditional love. You know, you, you had to meet a certain criteria, you had to... Um, it was almost like... It was almost like a class sense, if that makes sense, like middle class, upper class. You would get certain people hang around in certain cliques is probably a better way to describe it. So if you didn't fit into that, you know, you couldn't hang around with those, that family or you, you were marginalized. Um, but anyway, my, my friend in the end, she just got so disillusioned that she left. And um, I tried several times, she was very depressed. She had a lot to cope with um, and I, I tried very hard to contact her. I used to go round to her house. She wouldn't answer the door to me, uh, which was very distressing because this friend, we probably, I've got a twin sister. I used to spend more time with my friend, <laughs> which is probably terrible. Um, I used to probably spend maybe three, four times a week we used to spend together because our children all grew up, they were the same age, so we used to do a lot of things together. So she actually sent me a letter, and um, if I just read it to you, it, it says, Dear Jen, I thought I owed you an explanation as to why I haven't been in touch with you. First of all, thanks for your card. Um, after a lot of thoughts and soul searching, I came to the conclusion that the witnesses don't have all the answers. We can all say I'm into that. <laughs> Um, I can't see how a loving God, um, a loving God not allowing families to be together or even speak to one another. I haven't seen my brother for months. I also can't accept that the witnesses think that they are the only ones who are right. The biggest thing that turns me away from the witnesses is the fact that they are hypocrites. When I needed them the most, they weren't there for me. If you don't attend three meetings a week, um, then, you, then you don't belong. End of story. This is where it gets interesting. I've started to go to the New Life Church and going there makes me very happy. Even if they are wrong, which I really don't think they are, because they truly love God and believe all the Bible, um, then I, I don't care because I, I don't want to live forever anyway. <laughs> so, you see, I have now committed three... Sorry, I'm struggling to read this because it's a photocopy and um, she was really... Uh, writing was so squiggly. Um, I have now committed three disfellowshipping acts, trying to take my own life, which it does actually bring you to that point. Um, 
having blood and into worship, which means going to new life. So sure, you can... Um, so since you still go to the kingdom all, I can't speak to you anymore. And then basically it goes on to say that she's made new friends. And that if I ever leave the kingdom all, to go look her up. <laughs> That's what it said. Not long after she wrote that letter, I do believe that she came to Christ, but not long after that she wrote that letter, about a year later, it was quite a bad year actually. 2004 was a bad year. My dad died, but I think what hurt me the most was that my best friend died in a house fire. And um, we went back to the funeral and um, we went to the funeral. And I can honestly say all the people that, that were there were the ones that just left her, betrayed her. They weren't there for her. And I was just so angry and so mad. And if I can honestly say, which is really bad, but if I had a machine gun that day, I would have happily shot everybody that was there because I was so cross and so angry at the way she was treated. And um, it was, it was a very difficult year. Um, I kind of went off the rails a little bit and uh, Jason was very patient and understanding. <laughs> and um, he just loved me, he didn't understand. Grief is a terrible thing, but when it's like to, in such a short time, it was very, very difficult. Moving forward to 2008, 2008, we were disassociated and um, there was a family that we were families with, uh, friends with for 10, 11 years. And um, there was three families that lived in our village. And the next day after the call had gone forth, that we're disassociated. I took Jasmine to school, took the boys to school, and um, my so-called friend, who the youngest one was two months older than Jasmine, so they had, they had all, the, the boys, their, their girls and our boys had all grown up together. I said good morning to her, hello, because they said that nothing would change, and uh, Lo and behold, she just ignored me. And it was like grief. It's difficult really to describe the hurt that you experience, but it was like grief. And um, so I, I kind of walked away and then something stopped me and, and I just got really angry. And I just walked back to her and I tried to make her look me in the eye, but she wouldn't. And I think she was just as hurt as what I was because she was sticking to protocol. She was doing what she knew she had to do. And it was very painful for both of us. Um, so anyway, as I kept saying good morning to her every morning, as I always did because I, she was my friend, um, they eventually moved 10 miles away so they didn't have to see me every day at school. So uh, it, it was, I think the whole situation was probably the hardest on Jasmine, the youngest and the oldest. They had, they really, really struggled with all of it. Um, so yeah, that it's, I did eventually, I did eventually <laughs> come to faith. The Lord 
drew me in a way which was, it, it was just, I just got on with life really. And um, you sometimes wonder how you get through those things. And I, Jason didn't mention this, but when we, when we started courting, about three weeks when we started courting, I was in a really bad car crash. And um, I was given two hours to live. So Jason got everybody that he knew praying. And um, praise God, I'm here today. <laughs> and I'm just so grateful for, I just, I think because we, we had that closeness right from kind of the very beginning and because I just feel that because God was involved right from the very beginning that he had a, he had a, he was what, he had a hold on us right, he was guiding us in a sense. Um, he was helping us along the way. And um, there was so many things that kind of, you just don't know how you get through in life. You just, you just can't even imagine. And um, I did, we went to listen to a testimony of some ex Jehovah's Witnesses and I remember this day was, I just really didn't want to go. I was, I was just so stubborn and just didn't want to, to go. I just finished work and uh, um, I got picked up and we went. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. Jasmine, we had to stop about three times because she had car sickness. We got lost in Sheffield um, and the... It, it just, we were just so late when we got there, weren't we? And we had to sit at the front because there was no seats. So the first thing we heard when we went into this, this hall was the shofar blowing. And it, it really did something, it, it just did something to me that I just can't explain. It was just so overwhelming. And the first, one of the first songs that we sang was Amazing Grace. And I... <laughs> And that was it. <laughs> the Lord had got me. <laughs> I, I was his because I knew that there was no more running and there was no more hiding, that I was his and he was mine. And I just kind of, it was hard to actually, we was talking about this yesterday, that it's, it's hard to look back over all of this because it, it's hard to even think that, that, that this was us. We, we were these people, but we're not those people anymore. We've, we're a new creation in Christ, and he's, um, he's really brought us on leaps and bounds. I mean, he's, he's had to do not just a, a major job on Jason, but he's had to do a major job on me, as in marriage and everything. He's had to really work on us both, and he's still working on us both. But I was, we were listening to a, a song on the way here by Casting Crowns, and um, one of the, the lines in it was, your, your, wor your world is not falling apart, it's falling into place. And although right back there in 2004, when I felt like my whole world was falling apart, we both felt like everything had kind of collapsed, that we have to be broken for the Lord to work on us. And that was the... It was all the startings of something incredible and amazing. And we can only be, well, just thankful to our Lord for what he's done in our lives and what he will continue to do. So I'm, I'm just really overwhelmed. <laughs> So I'll, I'll draw that, draw it all to a close. Um, coming to faith is a very personal thing. Very, very personal. We tend to think that it has to be in a certain, you know, repent, this, that. The Lord reaches in and does things to us sometimes before we ever reach that place of falling on our knees and repentance or knowing everything because He's God. Um, now repentance came for both of us we understood we were before a holy God we understood all of that but I think for both of us there was an overwhelming sense of his love that we'd never ever sensed before 
never had before. That he loved me and that he died for me, personal. And he died for you, personal. All of you. Every one of you. Don't throw that away. Don't, don't cherish that, what he's given. Now we're, we're free now. And I want to just share a few scriptures. I didn't mention earlier, but one of the Bibles that I used in my initial studies was this tiny scruffy Bible that I picked up at a second-hand bookshop. And it's called the Phillips Translation. It's not used much now. But let me just read a couple of verses that set me free. In Romans chapter 3. What happens now to human pride of achievement? There's no more room for it. Why? Because failure to keep the law has killed it. No, not at all. But because the whole matter now is on a whole different plane. It is believing instead of achieving. We see now that man is justified before God by the fact of his faith in God's appointed Saviour and not by what he has managed to achieve under law, including Jehovah's Witness law. Hallelujah, I'm saved by faith. And as I read through Romans, I mean, the Lord just showed me everything. He showed me Israel, but he showed me that I no longer had to strive Further on in Romans 5, Since then it is by faith that we have been justified. Let us grasp the fact that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. And through him we have confident, confidently entered into this new relationship of grace. And here we take our stand in happy certainty of the glorious things he has for us in the future. Amen. The Word of God is alive and is sharper than any two-edged sword. If you will let Him in, He'll come in. You know, everything we went through, sometimes I think, why? Why did I waste so much time? But it's God's providence. God is sovereign. For whatever reasons, that was our journey. And we're sharing that with you to encourage you. Because you have a story. You have your own story to share. Perhaps now you're, you're going through struggles yourself. Maybe things that are haunting you from the past. But I want to encourage you that Jesus is real and he loves you and he wants the best for you. And I don't mean that in some silly charismatic way. I mean truly. He wants you to walk with him and be the man or woman of God that he's called you to be. As regards Jehovah's Witnesses, please pray for them. Don't give up on them. In, in the kingdom halls here in Wolverhampton, there will be ones that will come to Christ. In the Adventist churches, in the Christadelphian churches, in the Mormon churches or tabernacles, whatever they call them, there are people even now that are ripe for harvest. When they knock on your door, you speak to them. What do you tell them? There's no silver bullet. There's no specific thing because we're all individuals. All I would say is avoid doctrine. A focus on your testimony to them of Christ's love and Christ's work in your life. They have no testimony. They can't tell you anything if they don't know Jesus. And just really love them and show them that it's a free gift. By faith alone, in Christ alone. And so finally, may I share just a couple of scriptures with you to encourage you, if you yourself are struggling, if you yourself have had it hard in the past, maybe things still come up that you can't let go of. Well, as Jen said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, if anyone is united with the Messiah, he is a new creation. Do you believe that? Are you a new creation? Say amen. Are you a new creation? Amen. 
We're new creations. The old has passed. Look, what has come is fresh and new. When I look back, I think, who was that man? <laughs> who was that? That's not me. I am a new creation. You tell yourself that when things come and try to haunt you. I'm not that person. I'm not taking up that again. And the words of our Lord in John 8. Thirty-one, verse thirty-one. Yes, you were said to the Judeans who had trusted him. If you obey what I say, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Do you know the truth? His name's Jesus, and he will set you free. Amen, and God bless.